falls to me to wind up this fudge therapy section. And so um, I thought I'd describe some of our experiences as a, as a startup fudge therapy company over the last eight years. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, it's actually a great pleasure to be back in Edinburgh because, uh, little known fact, I was married here 30 years ago uh, in February. And I was telling someone last night, I still lost three fingers and one toe to the frostbite. <laughs> um, anyway, if we go back to, to um, the experiences that we've had, just a bit of background, you see that um, we've heard quite a lot about the earlier fudge industry which flourished in the 1930s and then after the, uh, World War II the, the, this industry disappeared which was an all, almost total decline and apart from a few fudges that were still being made in, in France it was impossible to get hold of any residual uh, fudge preparations I'm talking about from the western side. Um, it was so complete this decline that when I went to university in the 60s and 70s, we learned all about fibers, but there was not a single mention, uh, not a single mention about the idea of using fibers for therapy. Um, and that's the, that is the situation for the next 40 years or so. And then about 12 years ago, as many of you will be aware, there was a sudden resurgence of interest in fudge therapy and it was sparked by this lady, Becky Cutter, you see in, in Tbilisi here. Becky Cutter um, was talking to a journalist from Discover magazine and this article appeared in Discover magazine which was then picked up by the New York Times and that was the first many of us had heard about this and then there was a BBC documentary that followed but this was the introduction and this was the sort of first revival. Now, I have to say there were other people like Lily Smith in England and other companies and other scientists who were, were working in fire therapy, but really this re renaissance, I called it, started around this time. It was made possible by the Glasnost situation with the opening up of the Soviet Union. And it was obviously fueled by the rapid increase in antibiotic resistance. Um, it was a very rocky start, this renaissance, but I think we're now seeing a really distinct industry coming through. And the reason I find it so interesting was 30 years ago I had the privilege of seeing another industry come from absolutely nothing to a major industry today, and that was the monochrome antibody industry. And the parallels between the monochrome antibody industry and the, the new fudge industry are uncanny. Anyway, I will push on. Um, Starting in 1996, a steady stream of entrepreneurs made their way to the Early Art Institute in Tbilisi. And they brought, brought with them sacks of gold and offered to buy all the rights to all the knowledge in the Early Art Institute. And one of them was um, a fellow called Casey Harlington, multi-millionaire. And they set up a laboratory in the Early Arbor and in return for know-how, know-how, provided funds. However, it was a very short-lived marriage, and it ended in a very sour way. And what it did was it actually created a lot of distrust for the rest of us who were, you know, coming in behind and interested. But this scenario of people coming from the West, very, very arrogantly demanding a lot of knowledge, very dismissive of the of the work that had been done, was repeated again and again. So I'm astonished that the Georgian people. All the Polish people, all the Russian people who work in even speak to us at all. However, they do. Um, if anybody's interested in the history, this is an excellent book because it covers the full story in great detail from the very, very earliest stage right through to today. Um, however, going back to this, the early rocky start, the Georgians, as, as many of you know, are very, very generous and hospitable people. The renowned for it. And there was still sufficient goodwill left in Georgia um, and very strong personal ties through Becky Cutter and others to allow this um, the science, allow scientists like me to come along and for this renaissance, which was in a very shaky state, to continue. And so I found myself in 
this is an Afaj pilgrim, I found myself in the beautiful city of Tbilisi, and it's almost exactly, this is from a century ago, but it's almost exactly the same now, if you come from the same perspective. In fact, I stayed in a hotel up there, so if you ever get a chance. I arrived a skeptic, returned a convert, and then came back to Australia and decided to set up the first farm stone company in 2002. It's quite a journey. It's been a privilege, actually, to, to see this fledgling industry come from just this revival of the industry come from nothing, take its first steps. And it's probably about the most interesting journey that any scientist could have, because you've got this vast history, you've got a major problem out there waiting to be solved, you've got these fascinating little creatures, the bacteriophages, and you've got a, an amazing list of heretics and eccentric characters, the like of which I've not seen before. Um, I, as you can see here, I went to some really exotic locations, lost a lot of money, uh, became an expert in Georgian wine, and generally had a very good time. This is just a bit of a historical note so you can understand some of the characters. This is uh, Eliade here on the left, and Durrell in about 1934. My Georgian colleagues might know better about the time. Here, and this took place just last year. This is um, Eliada's granddaughter. And here on the right is my marketing manager, who also happens to be Durrell's great-grandson. So the two, the two families had not met since 1934 and with, uh, with Eliada's execution by the KGB. And so last year, for the first time, these two descendants met for the first time. So there's all these historical threads to the story. Our, our story as a startup company is pretty typical of the other large companies, I think. There's clearly a major problem of antibiotic resistance. And it's clear when you speak to any of the industries, it spreads across five major industries, you know, human health, veterinary, plants, aquaculture, environment. So there's a big demand out there. Our problem was, having seen the early history, we wanted to come back and, and set this new, the, our particular part of the, the company, we wanted to set up on a very solid scientific platform. We didn't want to just rush in, take for granted what had been said, and um, yeah, push on from there. We wanted to have a really solid platform. So that meant sort of starting from the beginning, doing proof of principle studies, get a very solid scientific platform. And so we built a fire laboratory in Sydney, and I deliberately tried to send staff to Georgia and the US to the other Farge laboratories because I thought that the quickest way to come up to speed was to speak to people who had long experience. And here you can see another sort of historical thing. This is uh, Dr. Neparani, who used to be production chief at Ecuador. And this is my chief logician, that's what I call them. Chief logician Sandra. And they're holding an original box of um, this is the original box of Durrell's fathers that he brought from France into uh, Georgia to set up the industry, the whole uh, institute. And strangely enough, these things are still working after 70 years. They, they took some of them and tried them, and they're still going getting plaques. So quite stable, aren't they? And this is uh, Zemphira Aladitsu. We do a lot of work with her, and she's been a great help. And here's Hugo again.